Gentlemen, we do not stop till nightfall. What about breakfast? We've already had it. We've had one, yes. What about second breakfast? Hello again, uh, comrades and friends. This is DCHL Cole here, and we've got another episode of Second Breakfast. A uh, long time no see. I actually, I think I owe you guys a couple of quick apologies. First of all, I said that I would try and make these a weekly sort of release schedule, and I kind of dropped the ball on that last week. Sorry about that. I was uh, sick, and so my voice didn't really sound great, and I figured it wouldn't be wouldn't be the best for recording. So we actually got a little bit of the sniffles right now, so hopefully that's not, not coming through over the mic. Hopefully y'all can hear me. And second apology is actually for being more or less not present in the uh, the comment section for the the magic meta video, the last one I did. Uh, the the point of these videos, in my opinion, is to actually drum up discussion and get people talking. And I'm gonna be try and be really really present in the comment section, but sadly I just I just didn't have time to keep up with it. I had a lot of work for school. It was midterms week, so. I was just trying to trying to stay afloat. So sorry about that. I'm definitely gonna be more present in this episode's comment section, so keep the great discussion going. I actually saw I read through some of the comments on the last video and I am loving it. Like people are getting in depth, people are actually discussing this stuff, and it's it's just it's great to see. I really love this community because of that. Alright, so what is on our plate for today? We have another army analysis, uh, because last one was pretty fun. And actually, on that video, the Angmar analysis, I got a couple of army requests, actually. And I want to make doing requests kind of a priority, because, uh, I th again, as I said before, the primary point of these videos is to create discussion, and obviously I want to get people talking about the things that people want to talk about. So the last, the last couple of requests I got were for Erebor and for Rohan. And I just decided I'd go for Rohan first because it's Rohan. I mean, it's obviously a super interesting army, and I figured it would be pretty fun. So before we dive in, I'm going to give a quick disclaimer. Uh, Angmar is an army I played a whole ton of games on, but I actually haven't played a lot of Rohan. So everything I say on this episode comes from my experience playing against it. And, uh, you know, it turns up in a whole lot of tournaments. And uh, furthermore, a good friend of mine and regular opponent plays them. And I think it's, it's pretty important to note that before continuing, because playing with something and playing against it are very different experiences. And I believe both to be perfectly valid. They both grant important insight, but it is a different kind of insight. All right, so let's get started. Rohan gets, gets, it gets really an interesting reputation. I'm going to speak frankly here and kind of say that I found Rohan gets a bit of a, a mythos behind it. There seems to be some sort of like a legend floating around that Rohan is has like some some major problems and isn't particularly good. And on top of that, it's the most difficult army in the game to play and only the best players can make it work at a competitive level. Now, there's there's no denying that the army requires more finesse than your standard infantry force. That being said, it, it is the horde of all the cavalry armies, and I found that when it comes to fast-moving precision forces, Rohan provides the largest margin for error, although it admittedly does require some work to pull off all of its better tricks. Now that this mythos, it, it kind of taps into the counterpoint I made in the last video about meta. In case you don't remember, it was the, the idea that better players just happen to play the armies that are performing better, and this mythos seems to come from the fact that Rohan tends to attract players looking to create a fluffy army, or a thematic army. Now oftentimes, you see people who aren't aiming for top table take Rohan, because it reflects what, I mean, it's, let's be honest, it's undeniably the coolest moment in Lord of the Rings. I mean, I would accept pretty much no discussion on that point. The charge at Pelennor is kind of the greatest thing ever. Regardless, because it's played often as a fluff army, and played by a few skilled players on top table, there's this space along the middle tables where Rohan is less common, and this helps feed the myth that Rohan is you know, not for the middle class, if you will. I mean, that's a fun analogy if a bit elitist. 
but Rohan has shown time and time again that it is capable of performing at the top level of play, and to me, that's enough to justify its position as an upper tier army. Yeah, actually, you know, saying that, I just had an idea. I kind of want to do a video creating like a tier list for the army, competitively speaking. I suppose it would be pretty arbitrary when broken down to the individual placements, but I think that it could, could be actually be really interesting to try and get something semi-accurate going at least. I don't know, I mean, I think it would be kind of cool and fun, but by all means, let me know if that's this really, really stupid idea. I want to see. Anyway, uh, back to Rohan. I think, I think the place to start when looking at an army is its intent. What is it meant to do? Well, when we look at Rohan, obviously we see a combined arms force, featuring troops that all have the option to take horses and become the signature cavalry that we all know and love. Now, the problem with this is immediately clear. While this does provide a lot of options, one is clearly and unequivocally better than the other. I'm going to make a, a bold statement here. Rohan is only competitively viable as an all-mounted force. I do believe that much to be mostly de beyond debate. And that instantly makes taking otherwise sweet choices like you know, Grimbold for strength for warriors and so something, something really cool like that, something really awesome like that, a great upgrade suddenly becomes you know, competitive suicide because taking, taking an infantry detachment just isn't plausible. Now, a foot attachment for Rohan never really worked, but I th I'd say that that's true now more than ever. As troops are getting you know, increasingly more ridiculous in their capabilities, you have you have these fourteen point these fourteen point Iron Hill warriors with with strength four and defense eight. I mean, it's crazy. And a warrior of Rohan costs a low to mid level of points while functioning about as well as an orc warrior. Yeah, they, they can take throwing spears, but once you give a warrior of Rohan a throwing spear and a shield, they cost the same as an Urukai warrior, with one less strength and one less fight. So due to this, we're gonna be discussing all mounted Rohan, because a combined arms or all infantry Rohan just it isn't the best option when you're when you're looking at it competitively. So what does Rohan have going for it? Let's talk strengths. They have heroes. A whole lot of them. Cheap named heroes grow on trees in the Rohan Force. Now, what, what does this mean? Well, there are two upsides and one downside, in my opinion. Now, the first upside is that this makes Rohan the only you know, viable, the only viable cavalry horde. Cheap heroes, along with reasonably priced riders, means you can expect to complete two warbands by 500 points with ease. That's not something much cavalry can accomplish. The second upside is might. Now this is a key point and the cornerstone of the army, so I'm actually going to return to it later when we talk about one of my favorite conundrums of the force. Uh, you're going to have to wait and see on that one. I'm actually pretty excited to talk about that. But anyway, now to the, the downside. Rohan doesn't have the option to go big. Now, the biggest hero choice is Aemir, Knight of the Pelennor. Now, Aemir is inarguably an excellent choice great value very powerful that being said he's fight five and you know that's the problem within rohan you cannot find a profile above fight five i do believe that is the only major faction in the game without access to anything that reaches above fight five remember when i said that might was the cornerstone of the army well, you really need to practice that might management because you're going to be spending big on heroic strikes, especially if you choose not to ally in magic. Now, I hear a lot that Aomer should be fight six. While this certainly would be fair, like thematically speaking, I do think it would make him absolutely insane in terms of game balance. I know comparing a good and an evil hero is frowned upon, as taking the other is never actually an option, but I think it is useful to compare him to Shagrat, war leader of Sirathungal. Now, Shagrat is fight 5, strength 5, descent 7, 3 is in all the right places. He comes along with the ability to knock enemies down on the charge. And Aemir is the same, although strength 4 base. He makes up for it by going up to strength 5 on the charge and gaining an additional attack as well as the knockdown because he can take a horse. Moreover, they're only 5 points in price apart, so I think a comparison is kind of inevitable almost. Now, I should mention that Shagrat is probably my favorite profile in the game. I never take Mordor without him. 
in my opinion, he is one of the most powerful models in the game. Despite looking to be fairly costed, he routinely performs above and beyond his price point. That being said, his one drawback is Courage 4. When the army breaks, he runs. Aemer doesn't have this problem. He's Courage 5, and he will go up to Courage 7 because Urkenbrand will be on the field. This makes him an incredibly powerful model. Taking him to fight 6, while thematically appropriate, could be a touch over the top unless his points took a leap as well. Knight of the Pelnort, he should be one of the first three models that you consider in your Rohan ar army. Now, the next model in this, this Rohan hero triumvirate is Urkenbrand. Now, there's really little to say here. If you calculate his points over a similarly equipped captain of Rohan, he pays 10 points for a point of might and a point of fight. An excellent bargain. Then receives Horn of the Hammerhand for free. And if we're to take the Horn of the Hammerhand as being twice the value of a Warhorn, which it is, then he's an already solid hero who is undercosted by 40 points. Plus, he gets the option to upgrade your riders to fight four, which in this meta is, I mean, it's just, it's a must. You need it. Now, the final model in the Triumvirate is Aeryl the Young. And this is another one who needs maybe a little bit more explanation. Um, he's just, he is ridiculously undercosted compared to some of the other options. Let's compare him to Aemer's weaker profile, the Marshal of the Ridamark profile, with all the same gear as Aeryl. You can equip Aemer with all the same gear as Aeryl, and you would have a model that costs 5 points more, has an unarmored, normal horse in comparison to Aemer's, or to Aeryl's armored horse that moves 12 inches, and doesn't have Aeryl's free might rule. I mean, that that's just ridiculous. I repeat, I mean, Aemer pays more points for worse equipment and no access to one of the more powerful special rules in the game. And this is what brings us to the major issue with Rohan. Their heroes don't have internal balance. These three are light years above anything else in their list. Then you have you have Eowyn, you know, someone you can always take as a cheap warband leader for two extra might, who is a situationally good option. And she's kind of sitting in the middle in between these three and the rest of the heroes. But after her, things kind of go downhill. You've got Hama and Theodred, they're cool looking profiles, but Theodred pays too many points for a model with no fate, and Hama requires you to take Theoden, which is its own issue. Also, good luck finding those models. They're going to cost you a whole lot. Uh, Theoden, of course, as we all know, has no will. I mean, you know, beyond that, it doesn't matter what the rest of his profile looks like. In the current meta, a hero with no will simply isn't useful. I mean, we talked about this last week with the, the magic meta. I mean, it's just, it's not. A hero with no will can't function. They will never achieve anything. Now, Grimbold and the King's Huntsman both can't take horses. And as mentioned before, Rohan isn't the combined arms force that it might have been intended to be. Next you have, you know, Mary. Mary's an independent hero, so he can't function as a cheap leader like Eowyn, which means he, there's no real reason to consider him. And lastly, you have the captain. Now, the captain is an okay profile, but you'd only take it if you'd run through all the good named heroes first. It's a last resort. Now, you may notice an absence from this list of heroes. You may also remember that I said earlier I'd return to the topic of might as it's the cornerstone of the army. This brings us to the missing hero, Gamblin. Now there's nothing special in his profile. He's a captain with heavy armor and no access to a shield. So you only take him if you intend to take the royal standard of Rohan. Now for those of you who don't remember the royal standard, um, as you've probably never seen it on the battlefield, it costs twice as much as a regular banner and lets you give a point of might to any non-gambling Rohan hero with no might within three inches at the start of the turn. Now I have yet to meet the Rohan player who hasn't mused about taking it, but generally they decide against it. Once given the standard and a horse, gambling costs just five points less than AM or Knight of the Pelmore. Now equipped with the banner, Gambling fights at minus one to his dual rolls, because he doesn't have Boromir's exemption to the, the, the banner rule. Now this combined with his captain profile 
and defense 6 means that you never want him to see combat. This means that upwards of 100 points of your army is doing nothing. But as I said earlier, might is key to a Rohan army. They have a lot of it between their penchant for picking three might heroes and Errol the Young's penchant for being just incredibly awesome. But they could always use more, a cavalry army, particularly a cavalry army that takes as many models as Rohan needs might. As mentioned before, this is farther exacerbated by their love of Fight 5. Heroic strikes become a necessary expenditure. Given this, Rohan has a ton of might, but they still need more. This should mean gambling is viable. Now here's the problem. It's not about Rohan's need for might, it's about the way in which Rohan expends its might. This starts getting into the idea of how might is spent within different armies, something I find quite interesting. Rohan is not a burnout army. They don't run through their might in order to strike a crushing blow to the enemy in the way a fell beast force might. Rohan's might is spent slowly and is rationed out over the course of the game. It's carefully budgeted out between heroic strikes and heroic moves, with the occasional point being used for heroic combat or held in reserve to boost that critical 5 to a 6. A Rohan player needs to know how long they expect the game to go and spend their might as such because if they run out of might before their opponent, the game is over. Every point of might spent is a step towards helplessness, so you have to make sure that each point you spend achieves something important. This is the problem with gambling. His royal standard only kicks in when heroes are out of might. Because Rohan is not a burnout force, they must try to only run out of might at the end of the game. The royal standard will ideally, if you play it right, never get any use. If you need the royal standard, it's because things have already gone very south. A good example of this is a game I played a while ago against Devon. Uh, he took the royal standard to experiment a bit against my Wood Elves. I, I landed early on a Lucky Nature's Wrath that he failed the resist roll for, and the situation turned pretty dire. He had to burn through a whole lot of might real fast just to stay in the game, and once he hit zero, the royal standard was giving him free might. But here's the problem. It wasn't enough. If you're in the position as Rohan where you can be receiving the 1 to 2 free might per turn, then you're in a position that is nearly impossible to dig your way out of. It kept them in the game longer, yes, but it was still a defeat. Might management is a key part of what makes Rohan Rohan. I mean, there's a reason that the Dormer Lake's flavor text mentions him terrorizing Rohan. Games Workshop were kinda a bit on the nose with that one. So I definitely advise playing Rohan if you've got the models, as it's one of the quickest ways to get better with might. So that, that covers the heroes, and I'm not really sure I'll go too in-depth on the troops. You know, riders are your basic option. You spam out a warband to pump your numbers. Outriders provide a cool special rule, better shooting prowess, you know, sprinkle outriders into your warbands to improve your shooting. I'd suggest a reasonable number, but their models are pretty expensive especially given how similar they are to regular riders, so their inclusion is kind of your prerogative. Rohan Royal Guard offer an interesting defense 6 option. Sadly, Bodyguard is kind of wasted on them because Urken Brand makes Courage a non-issue anyway. Now, one or two won't hurt for flavor, but I wouldn't rely on taking too many because the points add up quickly. Lastly, you know, Sons of Aeril are they're the best cavalry unit in the game. And note, when I say that, I'm not counting Warp Marauders, because those aren't cavalry, they're baby monsters. And I'd advise taking a large number of suns. Going all suns isn't really the best call, as you'd lose the ability to shoot, but having a quarter of your force's suns would be excellent. The thing with Rohan shooting is that it doesn't actually have to be powerful, it just has to let you dictate where and when the fight will be. So you don't need to worry about having all bows, as long as you have enough to force the opponent not to turtle. So I think that that pretty much sums up my overall thoughts on Rohan. Um, I'd like to hear what you think about it, um, as well as any thoughts on on what I got right, what I got wrong, etc. You know the whole spiel, I gotta give it to you though. Subscribe to DCHL channel for more content, more Second Breakfast, all that stuff. And uh, hope you all enjoyed this commentary. Thanks, and I'll see you next week, hopefully.